addition to a PhD which she earned in, from Drexel, she has a Master's of um, Science from, um, from Temple University and a Bachelor of Fine Arts in Art History from the Massachusetts College of Arts. Uh, so when we hired her in 2010, we, we did ourselves proud. Um, her dissertation is entitled An Investigation of the, inner, of the Image Users uh, Across Professions, a Model of Image Needs, Retrieval, and Use. And this work expanded on earlier projects that she had done at Drexel that examined the image behaviors of archaeologists, architects, art historians, and artists. Uh, Professor Boudoin's um, research focuses on meta data, visual information, and digital preservation. This last spring, she co-edited a special issue of the Bulletin of the American Society for Information Sciences and Technology on the digital humanities and information visualization. Uh, her recent publications include papers on image seeking, the preservation of personal digital uh, image connect collections of art historians and art historian and archaeological faculty. Uh, the need for contextual <coughs> metadata for the digital preservation of cultural objects and the use of Flickr uh, by museums. Um, so that when, when we hired uh, Professor Boudoir, uh, we hired an expert in digital humanities, which is, which is one of the most exciting new fields in the academic area of uh, the digital humanities. She's, um, she is deeply committed to, to, to this field and, and has already been making a major contribution to the digital humanities here at Green State University. Today she's going to share her research on the visual literacy among library and information science uh, students. Uh, she's going to present to us a case study. So please welcome to the podium, Professor Joe Lebron. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you, Dr. Edwards, for such a lovely introduction. I hope I can live up to everything that you said I was. Um, and thanks to all of you for, for coming. It's such a beautiful day, and I know you all have very busy schedules. So I'm happy to uh, have you here to hear about this case study that I did, uh, where I examined the visual literacy of library and information science students. Um, this is the overview of what I'll cover. First, I'll give you some background information um, about why and how the study was developed. And then I'll provide you with the research questions that provided the framework within which I developed the study. And then I'll discuss how the data was collected and analyzed. And then I'll present what I found through the findings. And then finally, I'll provide some overall conclusions about what was found. And just so, for those of you who don't know, the School of Library and Information Science, where I'm situated, is located within the Kresge Library. And since this is all about visual literacy, I thought I had better provide some images in the presentation. It's a great picture of the library, too. Um, so uh, in terms of the background, who was involved in this study? The participants in the study were uh, library science students enrolled currently uh, at Wayne State University. Um, what did I look at? Well, I examined the um, I examined how much vi visual literacy learning took place throughout a series of exercises, and I also examined what the students' perceptions were of that lear learning experience. Excuse me. When did I undertake the study? It was in the winter semester of, two, uh, of 2011 and 2012. And then finally, why? Why did I perform the study? Well, there's several reasons for this. First and foremost, there is this proliferation of images in our current media-saturated world, 
apparently, get this, Flickr, over an, a million and a half images a day are uploaded to Flickr. So in terms of the big scheme of images out there on the web, that'll just give you a slice of the issue that we're dealing with. And one of the most onerous issues facing library and information science and individuals who are seeking images um, is this problem of access. Access to images um, is, in is incredibly difficult because there's this semantic gap between um, the visual information and the written or textual word. And currently, um, as you probably may or may not be aware, there are automatic methods of indexing images, but it doesn't come close to what typically users seek in images. So there are automatic methods that use the content of the images to find other similar images based on that content. But searching for an image that has an overall blue hue or an oval shape isn't typically what users are seeking. So that's a really huge issue since we still need to describe images using humans to do the work. And unfortunately, there really aren't enough trained people to perform the work. So what ends up as a result is uh, you have all of these images that are out there on the web and they're not described adequately. So that means typically that they're not found very well. Um, so um, let's see what else did I want to get to here. Um, so reason number three, the development of visual literacy skills among graduates or programs, uh, graduates of programs or schools of library and information science has really not kept pace with the increasing need for image description that's out there. And so we have this large portion of online content that includes really unique, rich collections of images held by institutions and individuals that remain poorly described and therefore much less likely to be found and used. And finally, the ACRL, which is the Association of College and Research Libraries, recently developed and published their visual literacy standards. And I was interested in examining how to operationalize the evaluation of visual literacy competencies, which there is actually a list of those. Um, we'll get to that in a minute. So uh, the reason why I'm showing a, an image of the Ruther Library here is because the collection of images that my students worked with came from the collection within the Ruther Library. So uh, before we get back to that collection, we need to talk about what do I mean by visual literacy because there have been a number of different definitions given for visual literacy. The first one was um, the one that was published by Jack Davis, who was of Kodak and also the co-founder of the International Visual Literacy Association. And um, there are many different variations on the theme, but for this study, I looked specifically at ACRL's definition, and I'm not going to read it here, but you can see the main points that have been pulled out. And so for the study, for this study, I specifically look at two standards of this um, visual literacy competencies that were published in October of last year. I look at standard two and standard three. So standard two uh, states, visual, the visually literate student finds and accesses needed images and visual media effectively and efficiently. And this gets to the issue of what systems, what resources, um, what other images can be used to learn about the visual content that they're being faced with. And standard three is the, visual, the visually literate student interprets and analyzes the meanings of images and visual media. So this means they're able to identify uh, what's in the image, identify and place it contextually within history, within um, technologically, aesthetically, intellectually, 
we're able to place that image um, where it belongs. So those are the two that I really focused on for this study, which means the students need to be able to interpret, analyze, identify, and describe the content within the image. The ACRL standards are really broad. They talk also about cre the creation of image, the ethics behind using images. So it, it's a much broader standard. There are seven standards, and I'm only addressing really parts of two of those standards. And if you're interested, I, I have a couple copies, and I can um, hand those out to those that are interested. So what images did we work with? We worked with the Virtual Motor City um, collection. How many of you are aware of this? Is everyone, does everyone know about it? So if you go to the library's website, there are digital library collections that are available from the main library webpage. And this is one of the ones that are available. Um, the images that are in here, there's a little over 30, 36,000 images that have been processed, and they were processed through an IMLS grant, which had the library system and the Ruthrell Library, which actually, although it's part of the <coughs> library system, apparently it's not, it's its own separate entity. So they worked together in putting, processing this material and putting it online. So when I first got here, since I'm really interested in images, I found this collection and the metadata associated with the images is, is pretty spotty. There are some that are very well uh, described and there are others where the content, as you'll see in a minute, has nothing whatsoever to do. The metadata that's in the record has nothing whatsoever to do with the image. So um, I went over and I spoke to the people at the Ruther and I found out the reason behind this. All right, so they got this collection of the Detroit News. It's a <coughs> photographic negative archive of all different formats from glass plate negatives to film-based um, media. Um, and it traces the entire history of that newspaper from the late 19th century until 1980. They kept all images past 1980 and the entire archive, photographic archive, of this newspaper came to the Ruther. So they selected out of those 800, oh, more than 800,000 images, 30, a, a little over 36,000 images to process using this, this grant money. And um, so who did the work? Students. There's some, uh, we're not entirely clear who did it. Uh, when I talked to Elizabeth Clemens, she said that honor students did it. And when I talked to somebody else, they said that actually students in the school did it. So I'm not really sure who did the work. But the reality of the situation was all that the students were asked to do was to type in what information was found on the folder that a group of negatives may be in. So, that's the first issue with how the images were processed. Um, what else do I need to tell you about this particular collection? Is there anything that I've missed? No. Okay, so this is the, this is the basic uh, entry screen of how you can search for images there. So in terms of the questions that I used to frame the study, I wanted to know what activities, or if there were activities, that could increase the visual literacy of, among our students in the area of image description and analysis. And then the second question was, how do students perceive their learning? So that could inform actually what I develop in the future that might assist in being able to develop the visual literacy skills even further. So there were um, 31 students that I examined that were enrolled in the MLIS program. Um, they were all enrolled in a digital libraries course that I taught. Um, the course is conducted completely online, asynchronously. There are um, slides, there is audio that accompanies the slide, and then there's a little video of me, um, because students say that they like the fact that I'm there, it makes them Pay attention more <coughs> psychologically. Um, I would rather not because it makes it really hard when you go to update your slides. Um, and then they also have PDFs of the slides and handouts that also go along 
uh, with the content that's being presented. There are several prerequisites for the course. There is a course that's an introduction to the library and information science profession. There's an introduction to reference course, an introduction to cataloging, and a basic information technology course that are all prerequisites for the students uh, in this course. So in terms of the data that was collected, it was a qualitative study because I was really interested in examining the students' own understanding of the learning process and their responses to that. Um, and also um, their image descriptions. There really is no way that you could do that um, with a quantitative approach. So the data that I collected was image records and their blog reflections. And they're collected at three points in the semester, in the first week with uh, assignment uh, exercise one, midpoint with uh, another exercise, and at the end of the semester in week 13. So the image records, um, the data that I processed or analyzed was held in Excel spreadsheets. The Ruther Library did a download of all the data that's in the uh, Virtual Motor City collection and then I selected records that are particularly weak and then I assign a group of records um, to individual students. So uh, the way that I um, analyzed the data was I used descriptive statistics because I wanted to find out which fields were changed most often, um, which version was most often changed, and then I used case order display, so I displayed all of the separate versions to examine you know, what changes were actually being made, and um, I compared the data, I compared the different kinds of uh, changes. And then for the blog entries, they were all blogs associated and embedded in Blackboard. So I took all of the blog entries and pasted them into Word, and then I did a thematic analysis of all of uh, the blog entries using the constant <laughs> comparative method, which you read through um, the blog entries, you note themes and sub-themes, you reread, it's a very iterative process, you go through a number of times until you're not seeing any new themes emerge. And then, as you'll see, um, some themes emerged and sub-themes that were related to that um, came out of that analysis. So, um, in exercise one, as I said, it's assigned in week one, and the students are assigned a group of images. They're given a spreadsheet with data. The data in the spreadsheet contains the image number. That's the way they could search it and look for it on, uh, online. They also um, have, a his typically, because it does vary, typically you have historical description, century, and then there's boilerplate information that comes from the Ruther. I'm trying to think there's one other field. Decade date is the other one that I missed. Um, those are the typical fields. So historical title, decade, date, and then obviously the boil boilerplate information, the image number itself. And they're given very um, brief uh, instructions about what each field means conceptually, a list of potentially useful resources for them since most of these images are taken in the Detroit area. Um, there are a number of resources that they can go to for more information. Some Library of Congress subject heading examples since that was a field that wasn't present in many of the records but um, the Ruther archive said would be useful to uh, accessing the images so we wanted to add those for them. And a link to various other tools that they could use, such as the Art and Architecture Thesaurus um, of Getty, the Thesaurus of Geographic Names, also available through Getty, the Library of Congress's Thesaurus of Graphic Materials. Um, so those are some of the tools that they were given links to so that they could go to them. Uh, to look for more information. And so they were asked to add or modify the data for each record that was assigned to them. 
And just since the next slide actually contains the record for this image, I'm sorry it's so dark. Can we, is there a way to dim the lights a little bit? Sure. Because I, I, can, I don't think you can see the, the image very well. So, it's better? Yeah, it's, I think it's better. Yeah. Okay, so this is the record that was associated with this image. As you can see, steamships, Tashmu. And the record number, and then the historical title, which is where that title at the top is being pulled from. One negative glass. Historical title? Maybe not. Um, the date, the decade, the film size, the donor, and the rights. So we'll get back to that in a minute. This is actually the Tashmu, in case you really want to see an image of what the <coughs> ship looks like. This is the Tashmu. Um, exercise two is assigned in week eight. It's the week when we discuss quality control and evaluation in digital libraries. So this is an assignment where a second student goes back and looks at what the first student has done in the spreadsheet. It's, an, it's anonymized, you know, they end up figuring out who has done what because there's only so many students in the course. I think they all look to see who has been assigned theirs. Um, but the second student goes and is essentially asked to do the same thing as the first assignment. Are there things that you would want to change or modify that has been done in the first exercise? And so I'm just giving you some idea of the other course content that has been assigned to date. So they get information organization, more cataloging and metadata information, usability issues about digital libraries, evaluation, selection, project management, other issues like that. And then in the third exercise, which is assigned in week 13, it goes back, the spreadsheet goes back to the original student. And they're asked to re-examine their own exercise one with exercise two because they get that, I send that spreadsheet to them uh, when that is completed by the other student. And then I ask them to add, change, uh, remove anything that needs uh, to be removed or needing additional work. And since this is in week 13 and this assignment goes within a major project that they do, there's a real strong added incentive to do this really well um, and do this particular exercise at the end. So what did I find? The most, uh, the most often modified, either added or changed data uh, to the fields were those in title, the Library of Congress subject heading field, tags, which was really wonderful me for me to see because the students were asked to assign tags to the images. The original data did not include the tags and they actually did assign tags, which to me was, uh, was a good sign that there was a way to actually provide access to this material through free text tagging. And then they were also asked to um, provide a richer description for the image because some of the descriptions were non-existent, essentially. So what I found, um, uh, in terms of the title, as I said uh, earlier, probably the reason why the title was changed was because it really wasn't very reflective of the content that was in the image. Um, the Library of Congress subject headings Although a few of them did have Library of Congress subject headings applied to them, many of the image records the students worked with did not have them. And so the students really did attempt to remedy that situation by adding those to the images that they looked at. Um, and the description, like the title field, the description um, that was there was generally not reflective of what was seen in the image. And even when it was, they tended to add more detail to the description. Um, let's see. In terms of the modifications, approximately 60% were in exercise three, which was a shock to me because I thought it would have been in exercise two, where you had a different student with a different background, different knowledge, uh, different skill set coming to the images. And I 
really, I thought I would see it in exercise two, but it ended up being in exercise three, and that, that was a little bit shocking to me. But maybe perhaps that says something about the fact that they did actually learn something in the process, or perhaps it's the effect of knowing that it was going to be looked at in the final project, and that was imminent. Um, that's something that I need to look into. Um, so the majority of the changes consisted of things like capitalization, spelling, punctuation, and language, and it wasn't necessarily always changes in what was particularly um, represented in the image, although there was some of that. Um, and as I said, more detail was added. So this is, this is the example of the title. So here on the left, you see the original title is Steamship's Tashmu. And so the individual, when they first saw this and were asked to uh, change things, said, wait a minute, that's not a, that's not a steamship. And those are children. So view of two girls was what it was chained to, changed to. And then the second student went back and tried to incorporate how the steamship Tashmu actually was associated with this image. So it was changed to view of two girls on the steamship Tashmu, which when the first, the, the original student went back and looked at it, and really thought about this image, obviously, really reflected upon what it was they were seeing in the image. It looks like the girls are standing on a boardwalk, very rough hewn um, boards underfoot, and there are signs in the back, and there are lots of people and movement, and they're waving. So pretty clear <laughs> indication that they're not on the boat. They're probably waving to the boat. So that's one of the examples. Uh, this one is uh, relates to the Library of Congress subject heading. So in the first example, you can see they extracted out from the historical title the information about Garwood and Orlin Johnson and the name of, um, oh, in this case, it doesn't even have the name of the boat, just as boats, a very general heading. The second person, with some understanding a richer understanding, perhaps, of the Library of Congress's subject headings, knew that the names were inverted, so they inverted the names. Well, guess what? In exercise three, it was the same. It was the same as exercise two. However, if you go and actually search the authorities at the Library of Congress, the, the uh, authorized heading for Gar Wood is Wood, comma Garfield, Arthur. Um, there, Obviously, the person did look, since Miss America with uh, motorboats was a heading as well. So why the, the names weren't caught, um, perhaps they were just searching the subject authority list as opposed to the, the personal name authority list. But it was, a, it was kind of a, one of those slaps, like, oh no, I'm like looking at all this data and I'm seeing all of these issues just like this coming up in the data. So what did I find when I looked at the blog? So that's kind of what happened with the image record data. There seems to be you know, some development there, but there are still issues. But what did I find in terms of what the students felt about the entire process? Well, they were really frustrated and dissatisfied overall. There were um, some passages where they said there were things that they enjoyed, and we'll get to those in a minute. Um, so the, um, when I was going through the data, it was really clear there were things that were outside of them that they really had no control over, that they were frustrated with. And then there were things that were internal issues that they could possibly have some ability to change that they were also associated with. So in terms of the external issues, they were really frustrated by the limitations of the vocabularies and also the clunkiness of working with the vocabularies. For many of the images, um, they had this concept in mind but couldn't find the correct term using the vocabularies um, to apply to the image. So that was one of the frustrations, also the fact that the tools were difficult to use to actually search and find what they were looking for. Another frustration 
came about because of the lack of access and availability in their local libraries, because some of these students are here in Michigan or even local, they could be on the West Coast or, or even outside of the country, as one of the students was. So the availability and access to the resources that could have been useful for them to gain more information about what they were actually seeing in the images um, was something that they were concerned with. They also talked about the, the time. Now some of this obviously is an internal time management issue, but they really talked about the fact that they needed more time to look at the images to be able to describe them more thoroughly, to do the research that's required to do that work. They were also frustrated when there was data already in the field, the students would freeze. Can I change this? If I'm changing it, is what I'm doing correct and what they're doing incorrect? Or is what they have already in the field correct and what I'm doing in incorrect, vice versa, right? So that was something that there was a lot of frustration associated with. And then another thing that came up time and time and time again was the, um, the sense of sadness that was associated with the loss of many of the structures because a lot of what we looked at were architecture were churches church architecture or other architectural monuments in the city of Detroit that are no longer there uh, many people said you know I drive by that corner every day that church is no longer there or there's like a quickie mart on the corner now and it was really it was interesting to see that so many of the students really connected to that sense of the loss of the history and the culture through the loss of the structures that were there previously there there was also frustration associated with uh, internal issues so they all acknowledged their own limitations in terms of their knowledge about what it was that was represented in the image, the structure, the people, the time, the ethnic group, because there were some ethnic uh, images of ethnic groups and eth ethnic events, even events sometimes that are represented that they had no knowledge of. Um, they were also frustrated at their lack of experience and skill in cataloging and their lack of experience and skill being able to describe images. Um, and they also uh, were frustrated in the fact that they lacked confidence in their own abilities to do the work, which is something that I found interesting. So this is uh, one of the things that I, that I picked up on. In terms of their confidence, it was lowest. Again, when they had to, when they had to change existing data, they really were quite concerned that they get it right and they were concerned, you know, am I doing this in a way that is horribly, horribly wrong? Um, and they understood how important it was to do it right and to describe the images appropriately because they, they saw that what they did actually reflect upon the institution, the collection of images, and the user's ability to be able to retrieve the image. Because if it's not described correctly, it's essentially unfindable. Other issues that were associated with confidence, some, for some it increased across the exercises. So from exercise one, they might have been, felt very tentative about what they were doing. And by three, some of them said they were really happy to be able to come back after, uh, the, at the end of the course, because, you know, as they, this person said here, I have fresh eyes or I have more knowledge and I feel more confident in my ability to provide this description. But for others, it was a struggle from start to finish. You know, not satisfied at the beginning, not satisfied in the middle, and not satisfied at the end. Again, one of the reasons, because they needed more time, more time to do the research uh, that they wanted to do. So what they felt they learned one of the, the things that I was really happy to see that they came away from um, this experience 
was the fact that they understood, they had a better understanding of how difficult the work actually was to describe images because many of these will not, uh, don't want to, or uh, will take positions where this isn't a part of their job responsibilities. However, now they understand the issues that go into this. And so they'll be an advocate for this work. They'll understand how difficult it is, but they'll also realize how important the work is for people to be able to access these images. And then they, there was uh, learning that did occur. I don't want to say that no learning occurred. Um, and this last passage just tells you, you know, take, take the time to do the work, um, be accurate. And when you don't know the answer, be honest and don't enter the data. And that, that was something that came up a few times. The exercises did increase the student's visual literacy. However, I really have to say the increase was uh, pretty minimal. Um, there's definitely a need for more one-on-one -on -one guidance. You know, every single entry that the students are making and every cell of every spreadsheet needs to be looked at so that the students get the immediate feedback on what it is that they've done. I think that is needed in order to, you know, really ramp up what they're learning through the process. Um, as I said, they really did understand the challenges involved in describing the images. And that was, you know, that was something that was really important to me. Um, again, the students experienced a great deal of frustration during the exercises, and so I think there's a need for increasing the fun factor and doing the work. Um, there was, in uh, the blog entries, this thread that ran through how much they enjoy doing the research, you know, the detective work that goes on behind looking at images and trying to determine what it is that they're seeing in the image and identifying what it is and, that, and analyzing what it is that they're seeing in the image was really enjoyable to them, but they lacked the time, the resources, uh, and so forth to be able to do it. So what I hope to do, I want to continue the study on with a few modifications, providing the one on feedback about their work is really critical. And I'd also like to develop a framework for analyzing the image content, something along the lines of what do you see in the images, who is represented there, what is represented, it, you know, a series of questions that would kind of prompt them through the process that might help uh, lead them to richer data that's associated with the images. Um, find additional exercises to help them with using controlled vocabularies because it was such a stumbling block for them, especially the Library of Congress's subject headings. Um, and then I'd like to interview those students that I felt were really highly effective in their learning and see what it was that they did that maybe other students could replicate to develop their learning and then hopefully develop guidelines on how to increase visual literacy skills among other individuals who describe images. That's a, a far greater uh, project goal for this. So that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. And any questions, I'll be happy to take them. Content and structure? Yeah, I asked, there were several questions that I asked them to answer. Um, let's see if I can recall what they are off the top of my head. Um, do you remember what they It depended from week to week, but it was give a commentary on your experiences with that week's exercises mm -hmm. and your feelings about it. So you gave like a narrative of what you did and then um, your perceptions or evaluations of it. Can you go back to the attachment bulk image? Oh, sure. Question. The, the image of the of boat? The of the girls. Um, so for my Vantage point, it looks like I might say Pablo in the back. Would that be near the Pablo Island or is it on Pablo Island? I don't know. So that's one of those sort of local, you know, exactly how would students, you know, 
that's a, you know, so I'm, I'm wondering about what other resources they might have had to, you know, where, where the route of this boat went and what kind of resources did you put them in contact with? There was a list of a number of resources, one of which was published by the, is the Detroit News, I believe. I had have, I have the list and I didn't bring it with me. Um, that all got to local <coughs> historical information. Uh, the AIA publishes a, a guide to Detroit architecture. That was another one that they were provided with. So when that package of uh, however 800,000 with the Detroit News forwarded it to the Ruther, was, was that image in a folder that would you, it would, what might have the folder said, I guess? This folder said Steamship's Tashmu. Oh, okay. That's how this image was tagged with that label. So that's what I was saying. The students were asked to process the material through that IMLS grant, and the negatives were in groups. You know, it was probably the entire roll of film taken all at the same time, you know, of the same individuals or same event or whatever it was. It that the, with what story was ran and when, when You know, it might have, and that was, I also sent them to the, um, the microfilm of the newspaper. Because you could have, you see 8-8, which is actually probably the date the image was published, not the date of the image itself, although it could have been, you know, if it was taken in the morning, I guess, theoretically, the even, if they published the paper in the evening, it could have been published that day, but it, you know, searching a couple days, going through the microfiche, they probably would be able to find, but how many students, again, they're online students, the microfilm isn't online, how many students have access to that? It really is an access issue, you know, so we're trying to give access to the images, but the students don't, again, mm -hmm. it's the whole access, yeah. Um, are there guidelines for, you know, like, I'm taking a cataloging class right now, and there's the AACR. Is there, are there rules like that for visual description? There's the cataloging cultural objects, which is probably the closest to that, but it's not a standard in the same way as AACR2 is. There's also the VRA core, which is a metadata schema, and there are some standards associated with that as well. So what guidelines did you have them use? I didn't. It, because there were three, what, like, basically three or four fields that they were asked to deal with. And I just, there aren't any standards, and the standards that are out there don't really address this type of imagery, like VAR, VRA core is more specific to, say, art, although it might have fit for the architecture, and cataloging cultural objects. A lot of them are at such a high, a, such a high level that I wonder if they would be useful. But yeah, I mean, it would be interesting to see if using one of those, if that could help ramp up. Okay. So for this particular one, or maybe another one, what tags were used? Um, for this one, it was like girls waving, people. They were pretty. They were pretty basic. But as you can see, this record is useless for finding this particular image. There would be no way that you would find this image. I mean, one of the things that strikes me about this image is actually cool. I know, I know, the costuming yeah. is definitely, yeah. that so, was that was something that came up, one of the resources that one of the students said, this would be really useful because you could, although it is dated already, but mm -hmm. you would have more information about the costuming, yeah, that flow. Okay, from your research, when I watch Ken Burns on PBS, mm -hmm. and he's showing images, how confident should I be that he's really showing the right images and has got them right? Oh, I don't know. I don't. I don't watch many of Ken Burns' things. Should because I admit he, that? Because he does much of it with images, mm -hmm. and it would appear that 50 years from now, it would be very hard without some mem cultural memories of Detroit to accurately. To be able to, yeah. yeah. I don't know. I don't know the answer. I don't know what images he's using, so it would be hard for me to make. He gets it. them from archives, and I. I guess I was asking. What are the possibilities that this image says one thing and it's really something completely different? Oh, that's true. 
I mean, imagery is... Not that that even would make any difference, but... Right. I mean, you could say, okay, this is tagged incorrectly at the time, but yeah. how would somebody want to retrieve the image or use this image in the future might be completely opposite how it was intended in the past. And that's still valid in my mind. Do you understand what yeah. I'm saying? Like somebody might want to find this image and might not be using the original, maybe they're waving goodbye to their parents forever. I mean, we don't know what the context of this image was. These two little girls, or their parents. <laughs> you know, like they're, they're like small girls. I'm hoping the parents are right outside the frame. You know, there are all sorts of people milling about as a parent, I guess. As a contemporary parent. Yes, that yes, worry? that's true, because yes. in 1930 that might not that have might been, not been the, same worry. the same worry. Exactly. Can I ask you a question? Sure. Um, I'm, I'm interested in some of your, uh, the reflections you have from the blog posts. Mm -hmm. and. Um, I'm wondering if you saw any social themes because you said that you said that the exercises were given to individuals, mm -hmm. right? Individual students, right? And they didn't know the partnerships that you had set out, right? Right. So it was it was, it was like blind. a random assignment, right. right? So I'm wondering if anything came out about sort of this social that was social or collaborative because as I was thinking about what you were saying about the the 60 percent of changes happened in exercise three, three. when one person had looked at it, the second person, yes, had blindly looked at the first, first what they right. did was the first person's changes, and then the first person, not a third person, but the first person came back to it. Right. So I saw that as, as much as they didn't know, uh, this is my perspective as an insider, as much as they didn't know, maybe they were still working together. I was wondering if anything like that came huh. out. I didn't see that coming mm -hmm. Through, mm -hmm. But I know that the students did talk to each other. Like even though I tried to randomize it, and you know they ended up knowing who had their right. spreadsheet. Right, right. Um, and I was surprised that there there were a few students that were really good, had some you know had some really strong opinions and changed everything. But overall, most of the time they just did you know change the comma. Somebody made a spelling error. Right, right, right. Or, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, but anyway, you know, I'm I'm thinking maybe in future iterations, yeah. having it done collaboratively yeah. Yeah. might actually be interesting to see what the results are from that. To have a group of people looking at you know the same group of images to see what happens. Even just for that collaborative knowledge base. Right. 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 Sort of like because you if you have somebody that's from Detroit uh -huh. and you have somebody that's from, I don't know, Boston Absolutely. working on the project, each of them will come with a different kind of Absolutely. base of knowledge. And that's something that I bring up to all of them. You all have strengths in different areas. So Joe, this is this is um, sorry, this is this is sort of getting me thinking about some of my work because it really is a reading. Oh yeah, this reading. is reading, right? Yeah, definitely. Um, reading so, the images. So, so you know, we just at this table, we've been talking about the bringing together of a knowledge base or something like that. But you're also bringing together d different people's experiences, mm -hmm. their life experiences, their emotional connections yes. with different things to their reading of the visual image. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So we can get into thinking about Louise Rosenblatt and what she said about a text. Well, this is a text. It's just a different type of text. It's visual. Exactly. Really interesting. Um, this is not a comment on your work so much, but uh, my big project on the Modern Library series, a series of reprints of classics that began in 1917 and is still being published today. Um, as part of that, I'm trying to track all of the dust jackets and, and include images of them. So we're, we're talking about 800 titles, and Madame Bovary, which was in the series throughout the period went through seven or eight different, different jackets. Wow. And so I've, I've been traveling around the country visiting major collectors. I just got back the other day from Allentown, Pennsylvania. Sounds like a wonderful I'm going to Lincoln, project. Nebraska Sunday. <laughs> uh, but, um, you know, just scanning, scanning the jackets. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some of them were typographic, some of them were pictorial, and some by well-known artists, uh, 
unlike your project, there's no attempt to categorize, you know, to group them by subject. It's mainly for each title, but I try to describe the image and whenever possible identify the artist. Uh, some jackets were signed, some weren't. Um, I have some, I've been able to identify some of the designers from the archives. Um, there are lots of artists who just signed their last names and I can find nothing about Is them. Is there a, a lot of variation in the subject matter of the image that's associated with a particular title across the history of it? Or uh, is it all pretty well, some standard? Some of them were typographic, some of them were images. Mm -hmm. Let's see, for the, uh, for the Madame Bovary jackets, uh, well, I think they, I think all three of them, you know, show somebody who is supposed to represent Madame Bovary. Mm -hmm. So, image of a woman, you woman, know, uh, but, portrait of yeah, some woman. Yeah, and and uh, but but it's you know it's interesting because the, because the styles of designs yeah, yeah, changed the over the decades. Yeah. And, yeah. But it's it's been fun to. Uh, were the images you took from the publicly available part that's yes. on the web? Yes. Okay, has Google crawled those images and tried to do it? You know, itself? I do not I do not uh, find them when I search for terms you you know, so say I search for Tashmu, I wouldn't none of these images would come up. So at least they didn't went back okay. in the January Could you to ask May. the project whether they told Google not to crawl it because you can do that? Um, I'm not really sure why that came about. When I was working with getting some material processed for the library through the Digital Libraries course, um, we had a discussion about why the systems are basically closed and there's, because of the architecture, there's no way for them to be open to the crawlers. Okay. That's essentially what I was told. Now, whether or not that's the case, I don't know. Because that would be an interesting comparison. Yeah, oh yeah. I mean, that's a, that's a huge issue in and of itself. The availability of all this unique material just not being found because they're all in little separate collections all over the place. Um, oh, I have an idea that Ruther is very protective of this material, it's copyrighted. I actually gave um, a presentation and had used images from the Ruther and the association asked me to give the slides to them. And so I had to ask the Ruther if I could publish the images on the slides. And they <coughs> said, well, you'll have to send us the images to show us what the images are before we can okay it. So I just gave the slides without the images and, you know, just being too busy. But, but they're, you know, clearly they're copyrighted images that the Ruther owns the copyright for, which is really mm -hmm. kind of interesting because they're actually originally from the Detroit News, mm -hmm. which is still in existence. But so I think that was a part the, of their, the you know, the, the, the agreement the, the to take the images. That assign them the copyright. They would get the copyright to the images, which has ended up being, you know, a money maker for them because there are a series of images that are, you know, get published pretty frequently out of this collection. So. Um, do you plan to publish this? And if so, what kind of things, subjects, protections, or do you need to go through that? Of this. You know, I have. I don't know that I'll publish it at this point. I would like to publish it in a future iteration. And yeah, the the IPR is going to be an issue, I think, because of the uh, the fact that I'm. Although it's not. Um, yeah, it's it's, it's definitely going to be something that'll be a problematic problem. Would you be able to work around that by for future classes working with earlier images that are you know pre nineteen twenty three? No, it doesn't have to do with the images. It has to do with you the you. Yeah, oh, study. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, being studied. Some of the special doing yeah. studies. Yeah. I, I, I get it now. I get it now. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so, yeah. Any other questions?